General Dayan, you told the people of Israel by radio this week that they should be apprehensive about the visit of President Nixon to Moscow. Why should they be apprehensive? I didn't use uh, this term. I spoke in Hebrew anyway. I told them that I think that if uh, Nixon reached an, a, a formula accepted by him and by the Russian, we should be aware, I'm not sure that we, it will be exactly the formula that we would like, something like that. In Hebrew, it sounds better. From CBS New York, Face the Nation, a spontaneous and unrehearsed news interview with General Moshe Dayan, Defense Minister of Israel. General Dayan will be questioned by CBS News United Nations correspondent Richard C. Hotlett, Roland Evans, syndicated columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times, and CBS News correspondent George Herman. Is it your feeling, General Dayan, that the great powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, might try to force the Middle East into a peace treaty which would not be acceptable to your side? I am sure that the United States of America will not try to impose on us any uh, solution. About Russia, I don't know. And I did say that on the radio, too, that I'm certainly sure that, I'm that, uh, the, um, that Nixon will not, uh, will not cooperate or participate in any attempt to impose on us any solution. Do you feel, General, uh, the implication in that question leads me to ask, do you feel that the United States has ever tried unfairly to push Israel into uh, settling the Middle East problem? No, no, no not to push, not, any, not to impose or to force us into anything, into anything which we didn't want to. But I do think that now and again, and probably in the future too, there are differences of views between us and America. It is one thing to impose on us, and another thing to have two different uh, concepts. General Dayan, you spoke of a formula that you would not like as a possibility coming out of the Moscow trip. What makes you say that? What would you not like? Well, uh, for instance, about Jerusalem, for many years we considered Jerusalem to be our capital, and this is not accepted by the United States of America. Now, I am all for an agreement between America and Russia about the Middle East too, but I have, I have uh, to bear in mind that if such an agreement is reached, acceptable by Russia, then it might be a formula which we won't like. Any other points apart from Jerusalem? What about territory, the exact Sinai? Exactly. exactly. If uh, such a formula would uh, mean withdrawal from all of the uh, territories, or even from most of them, then I doubt very much uh, whether that will be acceptable by us. You, you said in December 68, General, when you were asked how much land Israel would be prepared to give back of the territory seized in the 67 war, you said, a lot, sir, a lot. That was December 68. In December 71, you said Israel must keep the captured Arab territories because those lands are a buffer, and I quote you, to keep a war far from Israel. Which is the real General Dayan? I don't think I ever said that we should keep all the territories. I'm sorry, sir. I don't think this, this is an accurate quotation. Now, when I spoke about a lot of territory to give back, I had in mind Sinai, and I still think that if uh, peace is agreed and uh, reached between us and Egypt, then a lot of territory will be given back within peace agreement to, to Egypt. But that doesn't mean, for instance, the Golan Heights on the Syrian boundary. Do How you about Sharm el-Sheikh? I think that we should could keep it. What does Sharm el-Sheikh give you that would uh, compensate you for the, the endless tension that uh, this would result in, the irredentism, the, the, the stimulation of the Egyptians to get their land back over an indefinite period of time? Sharm el-Sheikh would give us the control on the waterway to our southern port, a lot, the state of uh, Aqaba. And uh, if it will be for me, I wouldn't advocate our country to give it back to the Egyptian and to rely on their control and on their promise that we are to enjoy uh, freedom of uh, navigation there. The experience that we have with them is not a good one. 
But what about a UN force? Not a UN force exactly which could be the same, sir. which could be withdrawn, but a UN force which could not be withdrawn except with the consent, let us say, of the United States. Uh, how, how will that be uh, ensured? By the by the undertaking of the United States. What that's worth? Will well, the United States of America will go to war if Egypt asks the UN forces to withdraw? And the United States will not agree to that. Will you send your forces there? Perhaps an allied force. I think if that were the key to peace in the Middle East, the United States might. It was not the case five years ago. It was not the case. Let me ask you something, General Dion. When you said not give Sharm el Sheikh back, did you mean the other side of it, which means keep it as Israeli territory, or have you some other? No, no. I have in mind keep it, uh, keeping it as in Israeli territory. Not uh, in some hybrid arrangement such as you have on the West Bank where there is one kind of military force and another kind of civilian force? I'm not referring to the Western Bank now, but about Sharm el Sheikh, yes. I mean a, a simple thing that it will be a part of Israel. And th must there be a strip of territory connecting Sharm el Sheikh to the main body of Israel? Yes, this is my position. That's Along right. the coast. That's right. General Diane, the uh, immediate question before your country and Egypt is whether the United States will be successful in setting up these proximity talks on a withdrawal, a small withdrawal of Israeli forces from the canal and the opening up of the canal by the Egyptians. Now, Egypt insists on putting a military force on the east bank of the canal, as you know, General. If Egypt should decide to go your way on that and give up the demand of putting Egyptian forces on the east bank of the canal, would that make a difference as to how far you would be willing to withdraw under an interim settlement? I would like to go here on any technicalities about the distance <coughs> of withdrawal and so on, but I am afraid you didn't really quote correctly the Egyptian position. What they say is that we should undertake, before everything else, to withdraw completely of all Arab territories, and then they would enter into negotiations. But, sir, my question was, would it make any difference to your government if Egypt gave up its demand of putting Egyptian troops on the east bank of the canal? Well, I, I heard the question, but what I said was that I do not want to go here into any technicalities about crossing of forces, the uh, distance of withdrawal, or anything like that. I don't think that this mm. is the right table for that. If the Egyptians do come to the negotiation table, then we would negotiate and compare position. But uh, there is no point to, to talk here about distances, kilometers, crossing the border, and things like that. Let I me take like you back to Moscow for just a moment, the forthcoming Moscow conference between the President Nixon and the Soviet leaders. Do you think that the Egyptians and the Arabs should be as apprehensive as the Israelis about such a meeting? And if so, what might they do? No, I don't think so. And uh, if they are ready to uh, follow what I said, that is to say that I wish there will be an agreement, only that I hope that such an agreement will be in a way that we can accept it, of what I am not sure, what I am not sure. But anyway, uh, I think that the Egyptian too should want an agreement between the big power and not a assumption of war. I would like to return to the question of Sharm el Sheikh for a moment, General Dayan. Would it the possession, is Israel's possession of Sharm el Sheikh, uh, in fact give you the security that you, that you demand and, and deserve? Or might it not be a thorn in the flesh of the Arabs and in the long run prevent the normalization of relations between Israel and its Arab neighbors that must be achieved if there is to be lasting peace? When I compare the different alternatives for our security, I prefer our forces to stay in Sharm el Sheikh and uh, to face the uh, opposition and uh, the, the objection of Egypt than uh, the other way around. I mean, from the point of security of Israel, I would rather have this risk or uh, bad uh, feeling of the Egyptian about it than that to, to satisfy the Egyptian and to let them control Sharm el-Sheikh. I don't think that that will give, give us better security. How long can you maintain this posture of, of defense and mobilization or 
are you counting on the Arab camp to fall apart for the disintegration of, let us say, the Sadat government and or a successor government in Egypt? I think that we can go on for a long time with the uh, present tension. I would like it uh, to, to end up uh, one day, but uh, just now we have to face practical alternatives. It's not a uh, theory. Now, uh, the UN forces failed. This was not a good solution. And uh, to rely on Egyptian forces to take care of our free navigation to a lot, I don't think that this is a good solution at all. General, you said again, uh, to throw back quotation at you, that you made in August 1971, you said Israel must have the right to settle, quote, in any place whatever on the west bank of the Jordan River, unquote. Uh, by the same token, why shouldn't Arabs and Palestinians have the right to settle inside Israel in the event of a settlement? I consider the uh, western bank of the Jordan to be our homeland. And for me, there isn't much difference between the area of Tel Aviv or the area of Hebron or the area of uh, Jericho. This is our homeland. I do not think that Israel should be an Arab state. But you think, in other words, that even if there were a settlement, the Israelis should have the right to put up new habitations, towns, and cities on the West Bank in Palestinian territory. Exactly. I think that any settlement should include, include our right to make Jewish settlement on the Western Bank of the Jordan. Well, how could any government, future government, either the government of Jordan or a new government in Palestine, ever accept such a uh, condition? Exactly the same way that they can accept Jerusalem be an Israeli capital, and if you go back 50 years ago or 20 years ago, they wouldn't accept our settlement <coughs> to take place in, in uh, the Negev, in the southern part of the country, or in the northern one. I don't know the distinction, any line, really, that would divide the Western Bank, as if, uh, from our point of view, as our homeland, or by the Arab point of view, that Jews have the right to settle here, and they do not have the right to settle there. And I'm talking about the Western Bank of the Jordan. Isn't there some conflict between the short-term problem, the immediate practical problems that you face, and your long-range problem? You are generally quoted as saying the first step in eventual peace is to defuse the situation. Doesn't Israel have to do part of the something to defuse the situation? Must it not yield something somewhere? I don't think that uh, defusing is a present giving to us by the Arab that we have to give them something in return. As a matter of fact, I think this is of the interest of both countries and would be uh, of, uh, for the benefit of the Arabs even more than for ours. I don't think that, Jerus that Tel Aviv now will be more in danger if war breaks than Cairo or Damascus. If I were a leader in Egypt or in <coughs> Syria, I would have liked a peace agreement exactly the same as uh, with my present position. So I don't think that we should g give something in advance or in return. I think that both parties should defuse the situation and change from shooting to talking. General but Dayan, you have close contacts with the Arabs in the in occupied territory and inside Israel. Have you, in your contacts with the Arabs of the West Bank, uh, seen any consent to the solution that you envisage for the future of a, uh, the West Bank as the, the Israeli homeland open to Israeli settlement but closed to, to uh, uh, further Arab settlement? I didn't see any practical opposition to our settling down in the Western Bank of the Jordan. I don't know about a single incident that occurred since we came down and settled down in the Western Bank against our settling down there. I, I, I've been watching that for five years, and I can't see the Arabs there. Take, for instance, Hebron. I think that they like now very much the new Israeli Hebron being built near the old one. I didn't see any opposition to that. General, you mean the new city that you're building on top of that mountain overlooking Hebron? I found when I was there, sir, last summer that there was a great deal of resentment by the native Palestinians, the Arabs living in old Hebron. Well, then we have different uh, experience, sir. 
I'm, I'm amazed, though. You think, sir, that the Arabs really enjoy the fact that Israel is building a new town? Yes, on practically they do. Probably not politically, but practically they do. It, it provides them with work. I know that the people in the area, to begin with, as I said, I didn't see any incident. Did you see any incident there? But the uh, approaches that I were of are of Arabs there that they want us to go on with our building there because that provides them with uh, work and with uh, more people living there, buying their, their, their uh, products and so on. Can you I cite think that they just enjoy it. Can you cite a single statement by a Palestinian leader, general, to no. support that? No, I didn't talk about statement, I talk about reality. General Dayan, uh, you and uh, reportedly Prime Minister Golda Meir have recently been in touch with Anwar Nuseba, who is a former Jordanian cabinet I minister. I have not been. You have not. No, That's sir. a false report then. But your government has been in contact with him. Um, does this mean that you are exploring with King Hussein, with the government of Jordan, the, a settlement for the West Bank and a future relationship between your two countries? I don't know about uh, this specific case, the talk with uh, Anwar Naseba. As I said, I didn't uh, participate in that. But on the whole, I think that we should explore understanding with Hussein too. But are you doing that now? Oh, well, uh, no, not here now. <laughs> now, you asked me about a specific case with yes. Naseba, and this is up to our Prime Minister to answer because she met him and not for me. But in, gen uh, in general, I mean, uh, are you exploring? In general, I think that we should. If you ask about any specific case, then I'm afraid I can't answer you. I want to make sure that we understand each other. In general, you feel that, we, that uh, Israel should be exploring, I was trying to quote you, yes. that Israel should be exploring a separate peace with Hussein or a part of only a part of a whole Arab settlement. An understanding. I myself doubt very much whether Hussein would be ready to make a separate peace. But if he would, I think that we should, if we come to terms. But what terms could there be if you insist on holding sovereignty effectively over the West Bank? I didn't exactly say sovereignty. I mentioned uh, there our right to settle down there, to have uh, Israeli settlement there. And I can uh, go <coughs> further and say that I think that our sh soldiers should stay on, on the uh, Jordan River. Now, uh, to go farther than that, I think this should uh, take place between us and the Jordanian government. And, uh, I'm facing now the American nation. General, uh, let me go back to the Egyptian military situation. You now occupy and have for s almost five years a large slice of Egyptian territory, and yet we have just given you, uh, agreed to sell Israel about 42 new Phantom aircraft plus some other aircraft. How do you think this reacts on the Egyptian government in terms of their, the way they look at the United States? I think that they should realize that uh, the United States of America will keep the balance of forces. And that is to say that the way to come to an agreement with us is not by force, but by negotiation. I do hope that they would realize that we are not going to get weak and that uh, the United States of America will keep its obligation to, to provide us with arms as long as the Russians are providing the Egyptians wi with arms. So that the way to settle things would be by negotiation and not by trying to push us by force. But sir, when you talk about balance of forces, where I, where I lose you is that you already occupy a large part of Egypt. There is no chance whatsoever of the Egyptians to recapture that land. I hope not. And not yet with force, that no. situation, uh, you still come to us and ask for even more weapons. Uh, this leaves me, uh, I, I don't quite understand it, because you have the balance of power, or you wouldn't be on Sinai. Well, I, I really envy you, because we are three million people, and as far as uh, weapons is concerned, we have about hardly, hardly one to four. Now, uh, you think that we enjoy more than the balance of power? But you want to continue to build up your power, it seems to me, as though you wish to stay on the Sinai. We want to uh, continue to build our uh, power as far as we can in order to defend ourselves. I don't really think that a country of three million people can have too much arms, as much as their ma manpower allowed it, 
in, in uh, the condition and the uh, surrounding that we are, the, the, the Egyptians are 50 million. We are surrounded more or less by 70, 80 million Arabs, and they don't like us. As a matter of fact, they wouldn't really, they, they would rather not have an Israeli state there. But Let me ask you a few, a little bit about the internal situation inside your country, surrounded, as you seem to feel yourself, by enemies and uh, in a delicate balance of power. We have heard from time to time about increasing reluctance of some people, college professors, students, to be in a constant state of near war. Is this a growing trait inside your country? I think this is a general one. None of us like to be in, in this position of tense of war, and we would like to have peace coming. You don't need professors for, for that. You can take generals for that, too. Well, what has the impact uh, likely to be? Is, this, is it a growing situation? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't really see any major change, any major change in this aspect. I think that the uh, impact of that is that we should try, and I, and I really believe that we do that, every opening to, to reach an agreement with, with the Arabs, to try to reach any opening for that, but not of, nece of necessity to, to make a concession or uh, to give up the essential thing just for the, uh, let's say, peace uh, paper agreement. But General Dion, isn't that, if you'll excuse my saying it, isn't that a bit contradictory? You were willing to make any opening, make any concession, but not the essentials. But you not determine the... Not to give the up the essentials. Yes, not to give up the essentials, but you determine the essentials. Uh, there are people in Israel, too, who say that given a choice between peace and holding on to territory, you are, trying, you are tempted to hold on to too much <laughs> too long and therefore reduce the chances of reaching the peace that you want and seek. If there are people in Israel that think that we should give up everything and go back to the old boundaries in return to peace agreement, then I uh, differ. I don't agree with them. But uh, if you talk about the Arabs, our position is that we have our position and they have theirs. Let's sit down to the table and uh, try to come to an agreement to a compromise, but not with a precondition dictated by us by the Arabs. Well, let me I'd pursue like this a little bit, because one of the jobs for which you are now traveling, as I understand it, is to help raise funds through the United Jewish Appeal. And there has been talk, sir? And a lot of it. And a lot of it. And one of the other things that we've been hearing is that some of the Jews outside of Israel feel a little disturbed by what they consider the intransigence of your country. Have you found that to be the case? Have you found money raising harder this time? No, on the contrary. I don't know whether they criticize us or not, but wherever I went, I saw an increase by uh, the contribution in comparison with last year. General, I'd like to go back again to the interim settlement proposal of, uh, of uh, this government, the United States. Another thing that worries Sadat and the Egyptians so much is that if they should agree to an interim solution, a small pullback and the opening of the Suez Canal, that might become a final line. Could you tell us on this program, sir, that that is not the case? I that think that is not the case. I think that if an interim agreement is reached, this should be just the first step toward the uh, final agreement. Would you think your government, sir, be willing to spell that out in some detail? I don't know about the details, but in principle I think that we never say that by having an interim agreement then we will stop all further negotiation about a final agreement. Well, if that is true, sir, do you think that it is possible in the document which would set forth the details of an interim agreement that a final withdrawal place to which the Israeli forces would withdraw could be suggested no. so that the Egyptians would know that this was not going to no, be... No, certainly not. Certainly not. What I am trying to say is that the interim agreement should not be the end of a further negotiation, but to say now exactly, specifically, where the uh, last line would be, then that there, that there is no need for any interim agreement. We can go straight up to there. No, who general, who needs <coughs> an interim agreement then? To see whether it worked. Oh, come on. Well, but, but I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really advocate any interim agreement or arrangement if I know exactly where the final line is, then let's go over there. Why should we 
make a station in between. But General, in, in opening the Suez Canal, the Egyptian government would, in effect, be giving up its last and possibly only Trump, because they can't, they can't drive you out of the Sinai. What are you prepared to do to make this worthwhile to them? You, you've got to give them some inducement to, uh, to give up this card. I, I, can't see, I can't see why they, as if, can drive us out <coughs> now while we are sitting on our best line along the Suez Canal, and they will be in a weaker position if we withdraw and give up our best line. I don't think that they are going to weaken themselves up if we withdraw a little bit on the country. Our consideration is that if we withdraw from the Suez Canal, we shall weaken up our uh, military position. Aren't you in your best possible position now? You have all the territory you want. You have peace. Why should you do anything? Why we should you not stay peace. just where it is? Because we don't have peace. Comparatively. Well, we would like to have something better. Well, what do you, is it, would you like it enough to really make some concessions toward exactly. that? Exactly. Exactly. As I said, that I was, uh, I was asked here about the Sharm el Sheikh. I don't think that, that we should give up that, but we should withdraw within peace agreement from the Suez Canal and compromise with the Egyptian about the exact line between the Suez Canal that I think that we should withdraw from within peace agreement and the uh, previous boundaries, which, which I think we should not go back to. Something General, in any chance somewhere in between. Of your becoming prime minister in 1973, at, after the present term of Mrs. Mayer expires. We have 10 seconds. Is there any chance of your becoming prime minister? No, 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 I don't think there is. Thank you very much, General Dion, for being with us today on Face the Nation. And we'll have a word about next week's guest in a moment. Today on Face the Nation, General Moshe Dayan, Defense Minister of Israel, was interviewed by CBS News United Nations correspondent Richard C. Hotlet, Roland Evans, syndicated columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times, and CBS News correspondent George Herman. Next week in his first exclusive interview since he took office as Secretary General of the United Nations, former Secretary General Uthant of Burma will face the nation. 60 Minutes takes you on an exclusive tour of the presidential jet Air Force One. See this and other features tonight at 6, 5 Central Time. Face the Nation was recorded yesterday at CBS New York.